The China Belt and Road Initiative is something that was announced in 2012. Uh, it, it's an audacious uh, effort to try and transform China's hinterland, the broad hinterland that includes uh, the countries of Eurasia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and even parts of Europe. Uh, it's audacious because, uh, I mean, some people have compared it with the Marshall Plan, which you would all know about, which was a $30 billion initiative. Um, in today's money, that would be something around $150 billion. Whereas this one is, uh, I mean, the size of things are much bigger now. But even if you adjust for that, this is much larger. China is committed um, in informal and formal channels about $3 trillion to this initiative. So that's one big difference. The other big difference is that it's, um, it's designed to help countries that are very poor and are, have very fragile and weak institutions. Those of you who, many of you are business students, I know that, um, and would know that uh, institutions are the key to the success of an economy. So if you have fragile institutions, the rules of law, a protection of human rights, a protection of labor rights, it's going to be really hard for that country to progress. When the Marshall Plan that helped Europe was designed by the United States after World War II, it was designed to help the countries of Western Europe, which had been hit badly by, by the war. But they already had very strong institutions, you know, not just a strong bureaucratic system, but a function, functioning and highly educated class in a number of professions that could quickly use the funds from the Marshall Plan to provide returns. Whereas if you compare that with the Belt and Road Initiative, it's at, intended to benefit countries that have very weak institutions. And that makes the problem much, much more difficult, uh, you know, corruption, property rights protection, and I'll give you uh, some examples as we go along. So that, those, that's, you know, it's interesting that China would take this sort of risk, and we should ask the question not just what sorts of opportunities it opens up for, for those who are here uh, in other countries, for China, what it means for China if it succeeds, but also what it means if it fails. Apart from the monetary flow, there will be an immense loss to China's standing its ability to play what it hopes is its rightful place in the world as a, as a regional power, uh, if not a global power in the long term. And it would jeopardize the patient gains that China has made since the 1980s when it opened up and where it is now. And, and keep in mind as we talk through all this that China is still a poor country. It's a middle, poor to middle income country with a per capita income of about $10,000. But that's less than one fourth of that of the United States and about one third of the, or one fourth of the OECD average. So it's a poor country or to a middle income country and yet it has taken on itself the, the responsibility through the Belt and Road Initiative of funding the development of a very large area. So to give you some sense of the scale of it, Okay, so look at the countries that are covered by the Belt and Road Initiative, and you get a sense of its enormous scope. Uh, you know, uh, 66 countries have uh, signed up, either formally or informally, to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and they include China's near abroad, so Southeast Asia, South Asia, many of which of these countries have borders with China, not all do, obviously, like Sri Lanka. Uh, East Asia, uh, Mongolia, uh, you know, Central Asia, which is, you know, falls on the, uh, the western side of China. Um, you know, West Asia, look at the countries there, almost all of them. Uh, Africa, we have Egypt, and then even in Europe, you see uh, mainly Eastern Europe, but not only so. So, for example, Greece. Um, so, and... And so, so you can see the vast scope of it. Uh, I haven't quite told you what China is going to do in the Belt and Road Initiative, but so let me do that now. So there's a belt and there's a road, and I'll be showing you a map shortly about that. Uh, the belt refers to a land mass that China would like to connect with itself uh, through a network that is 
truly a network. It's not just roads or just highways, but also high-speed rail, also power lines, also internet infrastructure. So it's, it's a comprehensive economic corridor, not just a physical uh, road. And, and that's the belt. And then, the, oddly enough, the road part of it is a maritime road. So it's not really a road in the traditional sense. It's a maritime way that connects Chinese ports with, the port, with other ports, mainly in Southeast Asia and South Asia, all the way up to Africa. So to give you a sense of the scope, you know, what you see is um, the population that will be addressed by the Belt and Road Initiative is 4.6 billion, so about 60% of the world's population. Currently with a GDP of 22.4 trillion, which is in purchasing power terms, that is, and that's 29% of world GDP. So that should give you a sense that 60% of the population, 29% of the income, so it's addressing less privileged areas. But still areas that have growth, so growth potential and actual growth. So the growth rate of the countries averaged out is 4.8% compared with world GDP growth of 2.4%. Uh, total trade, at the end of the day, the corridor is all about trade, whether it's trade of services, trade of goods, trade of people, it's about trade. And 13.6 trillion is the annual trade volume of these countries, which is 34% of the world. And per capita income, so you can see, you know, middle income normally starts at around seven, 8,000. China sort of entered that lower middle income group. This on average, which includes China and you know, every country in it is 4,800. So it's a poor part of the world. And therefore, from that point of view, deserving of, of China's attention. Now, you might ask, um, you know, the world is awash in capital. It's, we're no longer in the situation in which the IMF and the World Bank were created in the 1940s and 50s, and then after that, uh, the Asian Development Bank and the Latin American Development Bank were created in the 70s when there was a great shortage of capital and you know, multilateral, multi-country, country-sponsored organizations made sense. The world now is awash in capital, mostly private capital. And even if you look at the three trillion number, it's huge. But in fact, if you look at money flows, it's not such a large proportion of annual money flows. So, you, you know, you might ask the question, why do you need it when you can easily access private capital? An important reason is that no one else is going to lend to these countries. One reason why these countries are so poor is because they have such fragile environments and, as I mentioned, institutional structures, that to lend to them is considered by private lenders as something extremely risky. You know, we're talking of countries which are terrorism-prone, um, we're talking of countries which have very high corruption levels, Myanmar, for example, um, where you know, the only lenders are really those that the government can persuade for political reasons to lend to it. Private lenders wouldn't touch these countries, you know, Kazakhstan and so on. So what's happening here is there's a need, but there, there are no lenders because of the high risks. And so you may well ask, if that's on your mind, why is China jumping in when the risk is so high? So China is lending at much softer rates than, um, than high-risk capital. Yeah, the kind of capital these countries can get is, not only are the rates bad, but the quantities are small. Here, you'll, as I'll show in the case of Pakistan, you know, it's a huge commitment, about 50, 60 billion dollars, which, which over a period of eight or nine years, you know, so about six, seven billion dollars a year, Whereas the best Pakistan has managed in the last two decades has been one and a half billion dollars a year. So a big difference. And you can see here, um, in a sense, China, I think, feels. So I attended conferences in China organized by the UN. I do some work for the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, as it's helping the Chinese government think through how to make this initiative really sustainable, not just about trade, but also about human development. There's a feeling that there's some readiness here. You know, these are the, in a sense, good aspects. You have a young population, therefore ready to work. So 
So that there's a demographic dividend that's waiting to be exploited if you can provide the necessary support. Literacy rate is 90%, which is excellent. And this reflects, to some extent, um, a legacy. So the Soviet legacy in, say, in Eurasia was that even though the countries were mightily undeveloped, the people's education rates were very high. Tajikistan, as an example, has a 50% plus tertiary education rate college-going rate. That's amazing if you consider that the country's per capita income is below $4,000 a year. And tertiary education enrollment rates are greater than 15%. So in about three-fourths of the country, there's a certain readiness. So what needs to be done? So what China has recognized is that this initiative cannot just be about capital flow, saying, here's some money. Go and use it well. Here's a loan contract. You don't pay me back. You know, we're going to send the Chinese mafia after you. They can't do that. So they've recognized that you need a package, which includes institutional reforms. Um, you know, institutional reforms don't happen in isolation. So the, you know, one of the best ways to improve, improve the quality of institutional reform is to make sure that the people who work in those countries have an active interchange with the people who work in the more developed countries. Okay, so there's people-to-people -people exchange. There has to be financial integration. So it's no use saying, I'm going to give you $10 billion to build a huge network of highways if there's no working capital that the people have to start small businesses around that to benefit from the roads. Otherwise, it'll just be, you know, if you just give the capital and build the road, they're not going to come. What they'll do is they'll just travel from one point to the other to work in, in the developed areas. I mean, that's been the, exa the experience of many countries that have built highways. And the highways, instead of carrying development from the more developed to the less developed place, carry poor people from the less developed place to the more developed place to work in, you know, in the mines and the factories. And so those places that are poor remain poor except for the remittances that come back, but they don't develop based on the development of local human capital. So you need financial integration for that, and you need some level of regulatory coordination to manage risks. So these are the five so pillars of the Belt and Road Initiative. So you can already see there's a fair amount of sophisticated thinking has gone into designing this from when it was first announced. So policy coordination, as I mentioned, you know, if you're lending, you need to have agreed upon terms of repayment, of disbursement, of risk management. Infrastructure connectivity is a physical part. Unimpeded trade, you know, one of the biggest issues in, uh, in trade is barriers to trade. These are not just tariff barriers that you impose, say, a high import duty. To give you an, give you an example between two developed countries or relatively developed countries, the US and Korea have a free trade agreement. CORUS, as it's called, the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement. Anyone heard of that earlier? I see some nods, great. So CORUS, which I think was about 2011 once when it was operational, it was signed a couple of years earlier, is designed to remove all the barriers of trade between Korea and the US. So unimpeded trade. It has exactly this as its design component. Uh, but if you look at actually what's happening, you see that uh, there are huge barriers to trade. So if you, if you look at the kinds of barriers that Korea has put up uh, on services, you know, opening a bank, a US bank in Korea is almost impossible. There are local content requirements, local ownership requirements. And the result is that if you go to Seoul, and I go there often for my work, you don't see American banks. You don't see the presence of uh, the internet giants, you know, things like Google and so on, have a much lower market share. Now, you can argue that, as I've heard arguments in, Korean, in Korea, that they can't compete because we have our local language and our culture and we know how to design products. But what we know is that right across Europe, where they don't all speak English, in countries like India, where some parts do and not all do, you know, Google and Facebook have captured nearly 100% market share. And they do it because they're producing a product that can be customized to a country's needs. So there are significant barriers even among developed countries. So the barriers here that China is going to face as it develops infrastructure, 
are even more massive. There are a massive amount of non-tariff barriers. For example, take a simple product like tea. Now, tea, you think, is, should easily be exported if two countries agree that the tariff rate should be zero uh, between them. Not so. You know, countries do things like requiring every chest of tea to go several hundred miles for inspection to make sure that the quality is acceptable. It's a pure manipulation. Okay, I know it because I did a big study for the World Bank on trade between Nepal and India. Nepalese tea faces this barrier in India because India is a big producer of tea. So to prevent Nepalese tea from gathering too large a share, Indian businesses have connived with the government to require that every chest of tree travels from Nepal to Calcutta, a distance of about 500 miles, to be tested before it can be sold in its main market, which is Delhi, another 1,000 miles in the other direction. So 1,500 miles for every chest of tea. So when I went to Nepal, I said, you can't compete with these terms. How do you sell your tea? He said, no problem. We bribe every step of the way. So our tea just goes straight to Delhi. And, but on paper, it goes this way. So these are the kinds of inefficiencies that I mean, if a country like India, which is relatively developed compared to many of the countries that you saw in that earlier list. Okay, so what's China hoping to get out of it? So China's aim, of course, it'll be a big investor, so it'll get the returns from the investment. But what it sees as the big opportunity is there are all these developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. You know, I gave you some names, Kazakhstan, for example which apart from its oil, no one's investing in. So there's, there's a big wall here between, say, the US and Kazakhstan. And China's saying, you know, we're close by enough to you. We'll build the trains and the, and the roads and the power lines and so on. And you send, you know, you'll share with us your industrial capacity that we'll help you develop. We'll provide you with markets for your products, which for you will be, appear to be relatively sophisticated compared to what you have inside. And China will take this, process it, add value, and sell it on to the more developed. So it's, it hopes to be the perfect intermediary in a way that uh, you normally wonder, can it do it, except that China's been doing it you know, for the last 15, 20 years, ever since the Asian financial crisis, China has largely through market forces, not through any deliberate policy, reshaped its economy to become the supply chain center for Asia. And now reshaping it again to not just be a supply chain center, but also be a center for services, logistics, offshore finance, and so on. And that's why when you see the growth rates of countries around China, the big worry is their growth is collapsing even as China is staying at 6 7%. China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, all growing at rates of 2 and 1 and 2%. So this is what China hopes to get out of it. So here you get a sense of this massive scope of the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, the, these are you know, trains, highways, all marked on this. Um, already there's uh, the train from Beijing to, to Moscow is under active construction, should be ready in a few years. There's obviously, you can still take the train to Ulan Batar and then take another train, but it's not high-speed train. They're building a high-speed link here. There's already a, another train that goes all the way up to Vienna. Um, it takes 15 days, so it's not very competitive right now, but with high-speed rail, that time will come down to two or three days. Um, there's a high-speed rail link being built in Indonesia between Bandung and Jakarta. And of course, the big one that I'm going to talk about here, which is China's biggest bet, is the one in Pakistan. So I'll come to that a little later. But I hope to give you a sense of this. It's a number of countries. It includes countries that are not formally part of the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, this, uh, the maritime road is here, and this, the belt is here. So connectivity, just uh, sort of to give you a sense of it, if it's done well, it should provide not just economic, but social and environmental benefits. Okay, so, so normally this happens, you know, if you look, for example, at the 
the European rail corridors that have been built, high-speed rail links that have been built over the last uh, several, about 20, 25 years, uh, you look at the ones um, in, in Japan, uh, although there are some risks, but normally the first phase is infrastructure intensive. It's within a country, it connects them uh, up with good links. The second phase is an area development phase which, supported by policy, can help countries uh, around the, the infrastructure. The third is it starts crossing borders, so two countries with uh, established infrastructure can connect through logistics and lower tariffs. And then finally, you have regional integration. So if you look at so what China's hoping for, it's already investing heavily in this. It's working with local governments on this and on this, and it's hoping the result will be regional integration. And you know, what's interesting is that when you look at the portion that's infrastructure ex intensive, it expands markets. When you look at the portion that's development intensive, it deepens markets. And this is what you want. You want deep markets so that there's social development. You don't have this phenomenon, as I mentioned, of people migrating to coal mines to work. You don't have the phenomenon of what's called ribbon development. All the development happens along that road or rail link, and the hinterland gets neglected, and that affects many other things, you know, culture, biodiversity, and so on. So market deepening is critical. And then, you know, phase three, of course, initially when you have connectivity, you'll, you'll save, you'll create jobs. But over time, you know, there will be a rising uh, quality of human capital. And once again, the intensive phases of development will lead to broad-based development. You don't want a situation where only large firms which own big tracts of land or big concessions or big oil fields benefit. You want it to be balanced with small and medium enterprise growth. OK, so now I turn to the case study of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. What's interesting, this is China's largest investment to date in the Belt and Road Initiative. I, I've noted there that this is a, being a map from Pakistan has an area here which India calls Kashmir, but Pakistan calls Indian occupied Kashmir, and then vice versa if you take an Indian map. So, um, so just be aware of that. But what this map shows is the ambition. This is a 1500 mile link between Kashgar in western China, right across to Gwadar port in Pakistan and Karachi port in Pakistan. And it includes highways, high-speed rail connecting, and an airport here. So many things. I mean, it's a big investment already. So to give you a sense of what's already happening, there are 60 road, rail, port, and power projects, uh, communications, industrial projects along a 1,500-mile corridor. These projects will uh, add 16 gigawatt of new power. That's equal to Pakistan's current capacity, so it'll double it. There's a port at an airport at Gwadar, also servicing China's naval and trade requirements. Note the word naval, very important for China. It wants to build its security, and this has been viewed by other countries as, a, uh, as something of concern. A fiber optic cable network. Now, this is very interesting. The Gwadar Kashgar fiber optic cable network will link through a backbone all the way to China. And the idea is that all communication, at least between China and Pakistan, and then you can imagine as it extends into Eurasia, will be part of this backbone. This allows then China to control to a much larger extent the internet traffic flow than it has hitherto. So you know, think, keep that in mind. It has various implications. It's scheduled for completion by 2030, but most of the large projects will be done in another six years. So what issues has uh, China faced here? So this, this comes back to those five pillars, and I'm going to sort of wrap up with this slide and one more. Um, so the, for protection of Chinese investors, they're putting their money in the Chinese banks, Chinese private companies. Most of these are designed as PPPs. China has been very explicit saying that these projects are all open to any country in the world. They've even given one American firm, GE, a $1 billion power project 
in this. Um, so one way that China's protecting itself is through an MOU with the Federal Reserve equivalent, uh, the State Bank of Pakistan on regulation cooperation. China is worried about the risk that its foreign exchange reserves are going to be used up with this uh, project. And so just to try and help them out, a substantial proportion of the investment is denominated in Chinese currency. It's not in US dollars. The risks from local insurgencies, uh, you know, Kashmir is a hotbed of trouble between India and Pakistan. And India is steadfastly op opposed to this corridor's work in what it calls Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Lower down in where the port of Gwadar is, Baluchistan separatists over the last two years have killed more than 50 Chinese laborers. So out of the, you know, this project will, is creating about 700,000 new jobs of whom about 30,000, so about 4% are Chinese labor, of whom just because of separatist movements, 50 of them were you know, been killed over the last couple of years. The Pakistan army has set up a division to secure these projects and the labor. So I hope this sort of gives you some sense that, uh, of how these projects will develop. This has become you know, the Pakistan corridor has become something of a showpiece for China because they're able to move ahead very fast. There's solid cooperation from the Pakistani government, yet we know from our reading of Pakistan how fragile it is. You know, it's the center for a large number of terrorist activities as, as it addresses Afghanistan, even into Kashmir. Uh, you know, it has had military coup after military coup. So you know, you're, China is saying, still we're going to go in there. Now, if it works out, it's going to transform Pakistan. If it works out, it's going to be a huge benefit to China and all countries in the world because you know, terrorism is intricately linked to economic instability. You get rid of the instability, terrorism is going to decline sharply. The whole world benefits. So you know, if it pays off, this will be China's entry card into world power. If it doesn't, as I pointed out at the beginning, China is in deep trouble. The Belt and Road Initiative, just to summarize, is a bold experiment in transforming China's regions um, you know, ad adjacent to China, and helps China as well, of course. Its scope is enormous, its challenge is significant. It requires the support of developed countries. Um, you know, and I didn't discuss this too much, but when I was recently met with uh, uh, people in the foreign ministry in Beijing, and one of their big concerns is that they don't have the know-how to really develop the Belt and Road Initiative in a very sophisticated way. And so they're looking to the West for know-how, but the West has been reluctant. You know, I, America, for instance, has been saying yes and no to the Belt and Road Initiative. It refused to join the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, but then President Trump sent an observer to the Belt and Road Forum in May of this year we don't know where they stand because they see China as a long-term competitor in the targeted regions. And as I pointed out, this is a big risk that will have to be overcome. So there are significant political issues, particularly since last year's um, election, right, of President Tsai in, in Taiwan. I mean, I think Tsai's intent is good. She sees that too much dependence on China is going to be bad for Taiwan economically. And that affects politics. Now, at the same time, Taiwan is so closely tied into China from an investment point of view. It's one of the largest investors in China that uh, I don't think they want disentanglement. They want fresh engagement, so a diversification of interests, not a removal of one and then the other. The ability to do that is definitely going to be affected by this initiative because as China embeds itself through this initiative more deeply within the politics of those countries, and it's going to happen. I don't think we can stop it. Um, you know, it, their relationship with Taiwan will depend on what China says about it at the time. Yeah, that said, I don't think China sees Taiwan's marginalization as a goal of this initiative, not at all. They, they are playing a much bigger long-term game for China's development. As part of the Belt and Road Initiative, there's a 
Xinjiang initiative, a Yunnan initiative. So all the, the provinces in the West that are relatively undeveloped are getting a huge dose of infrastructure finance and support to build out their infrastructure, which will then connect up to, to Eurasia. That is an integral objective of the Belt and Road Initiative. And also stability, right? Because Xinjiang is an unstable area, being Muslim dominated and Chinese being somewhat repressive in that area. I think the US would be smart not to be absent from the table. Uh, how it can participate can vary by type. So if it's something to do with services infrastructure, where the US is very sophisticated, it would make sense for the U.S. to say we can provide our know-how and, and that way make sure that the benefits are seen within the local country as being a product of not just of China but of the U.S. The U.S. can be a significant capital supplier and show its hand. I think the worry for the U.S. is traditionally the U.S. government has not been an investor. You know, we invest through the U.S. aid or those sorts of things but the amounts are tiny. Uh, it's been left to private capital to play that role. The U.S. might guarantee that to the Exim Bank or something like that. But that scale of investment that's needed is just seen by private capital as too risky. Even uh, private lenders in China, as well as Hong Kong, which is you know very much under China's influence, have so far been unwilling to invest in the Belt and Road Initiative. They just think it's too risky for them to do that. So that will definitely constrain U.S. involvement. But that said, I think there should be some positive uh, involvement. There are countries that are in the South China Sea that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, Indonesia. And they have, you know, they don't agree with China on some parts of the South China Sea, like the Natuna Islands, where, where China has conceded that the Natunas are part of Indonesia even though within the, well, not quite within the nine dash line, but just outside it. But then there's a dispute about the 200 mile economic zone around that, which China claims is part of the nine dash line. So, and yet Indonesia is saying we are willing to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So, uh, so, so to Philippines, so to Myanmar, so also uh, Cambodia, all of which have maritime uh, in investments from China under the BRI. So all of them, definitely, there's the hope from China that it will gain friends. Now, what's interesting is whether it will gain friends or not. Um, so Sri Lanka, if you look at it, might be a good case study, where China invested heavily under the Belt and Road Initiative, built this port for a billion dollars in Hambantota, which is the southern part of Sri Lanka. And then the Sri, Lankan had, had, Sri Lanka had an election, and the government changed and the government became an India-friendly one and an anti-China one. And suddenly the government said, we're not going to be able to pay this back. We don't want you here in Hambantota port. So China said, you know, we've got a contract and so on. Finally, they've negotiated something which is probably more satisfactory to Sri Lanka. China's taken an equity stake in return for its investment. So what was a loan has now become equity. Uh, but it's a loss-making port. It was built at the request of the Sri Lankan government, guaranteed by their money, but all those guarantees have been removed and it's an equity stake. China has no say in the management of the port. So if you look at it, China is, it's very hard to be close friends with China if you're a democracy because you have different ways of doing things. And so China, I think, recognizes these risks and uh, it's, that it's still going ahead is sort of interesting. I, mean, I don't have a clear-cut reason why they wouldn't worry about those issues, or maybe they do worry, but say we have to do it anyway. So for a private investor, as I pointed out, there's risk, but potentially as those risks get addressed through changes, the opportunities will be huge. I mean, think of it, these are countries growing at 4.8% with such degraded infrastructure. China will, you know, when they get the investment, these will be countries that are growing at 10 and 20 percent. You can imagine the opportunities that apply, you know, that will be available for almost any kind of work, whether it be in mineral extraction, in you know, 
support services. I think the best opportunities are those where, where for Americans, providing logistics and those kind of support services, finance, offshore finance, trade support. Massive opportunities there. The reality is China's record in IP protection has not been great itself. Um, but it has changed over the years. And uh, this actually is, you know, you can argue that most countries do this. I mean, when I used to be a venture capitalist at one time, um, and we used to invest in East Asian countries, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, mostly. And we found rampant theft of intellectual property in these countries by firms, despite having fairly strict IP rules. And it reflected the stage of the industry. You know, once you reach a certain level, you have something to protect, then you protect it, till then you steal. Um, I think China is in going through that phase. So it's now passed over the hump of needing to you know, steal IP. It's also started generating huge amounts of intellectual property itself. So I think you're, you're right. You're at the stage now where intellectual property will be protected in China. Uh, much of it will be usable in these countries, and it will be very hard for China to protect it. I think China will face the same issues that countries dealing with China faced, say, till the mid-1990s. So good point. No escape from that. But presumably the payoffs are good from other points of view. Yes. Do you see a growth in air travel as well? Oh, as an opportunity? Yeah, yeah, good point. Well, air travel is very interesting. So in China now, domestic air travel is shutting down. So people are not taking a plane to go from Beijing to Shanghai anymore. Why is that? High-speed rail. High rail. It's just there's no traffic now for domestic uh, travel, much, much less, unless you're going long distances. And, and so... So air travel, I think, will have a role to play, but much less than people might imagine. High-speed rail tends to be a pretty effective mode. How many of you have traveled by high-speed rail, you know, in Europe or, or in Asia? Yeah, yeah. So you know what it means. Yeah. It's quite amazing. Because I attended this UN conference last year, and one of the big questions was, is China using the BRI to export its dirty manufacturing to other countries. You know, it'll set up the steel plants and the coal plants and um, extract, and then all the pollution will be there. Just like they've told us you know, in the US that, hey, we're your outsourcer. We're bearing all the pollution costs for your purchases of televisions and washing machines. Um, so, I th so China is very sensitive to this. The countries involved are very sensitive to this. That's why the UN is working with China. So China signed on to the UNDP Sustainable Development Goals, that, you know, the, the, the 30 SDGs or the 17 key ones, and is trying to work out that whatever it does should be done to good environmental standards. Now, in practice, I'm sure there will be some compromises, but, if, but overall it should be better than what China's experienced. That locally, you'll have initiatives which are less controlled. China can impose environmental standards on its involvements. But at the end of the day, a lot of the investment will be small businesses setting up smokestack industries. And they might be heavy polluters. But I think there will be enough idiosyncrasy in each country that it's actually worth looking at each country's weaknesses and strengths. Uh, for example, um, you know, in um, Indonesia, where this high-speed rail project is being built, the expectation is that uh, it will create lots of new jobs in the textile industry. And Indonesia wants to be a player in that industry and has certain advantages. Even though it doesn't grow cotton, you know, it has good processing skills. So there might be some things that could be done in that respect. So I would think it would vary a lot. Uh, you know, again, in Indonesia, if you look at the growth of Kalimantan, Kalimantan is growth is being driven by mineral extraction, you know, gold, silver, you know, iron ore, and so on. A heavily polluted area. There's, there's a lot of opportunities to look at services that manage pollution issues, attract them. 
So there are various things that will come out. You know. might, be a, might be a good project to do to understand that. I would say regional integration should be the measure. So looking at the flow of people and goods um, two-way and within the context of the sustainable development goals, what does it look like? So for example, if you do not see growth of small and medium enterprises, um, you would call this, you'd be very concerned about it if, it's, if it would go back to the traditional colonial type of exploitation of resources. So you want to see area development, you want to see biodiversity uh, protected. So there are a bunch of environmental issues that should be measured. Uh, you ought to see new technologies coming in, um, in some sort of sustainable way, so you need the institutions around it. So I would say a package. I actually think the UN SDGs are a very good way of looking at this, measuring impact. China has free trade agreements. It's bound by WTO free trade agreements. So so to that extent, ASEAN uh, it some, would be something like Chorus, more focus on particular products, agricultural products or certain industrial products um, or services that are not covered by the WTO arrangements. So I think my sense is it may be not be that important as to the success of BRI. Mm -hmm.